14 seconds. Why am I out there? Good morning, Restoration Church. I'm so glad you're here this morning. Let's stand. Let's get ready to worship Jesus. Let's clap our hands like this.
battle you won without question. For every line you must silence from love. We acknowledge you in every victory, Almighty oh, God. For every promise you kept in the valley. For every burden you lifted with ease. We are gathered with great expectation. Lord, we believe. Go on, sing it. You never cease to amaze us. All of the praises, Lord, they belong to you. Jesus, just bring all the glory. Take all the credit for what you're about to do. Every good thing, every good thing comes from you. Every season you showed us your sorrow. For every tenderness you trust us to trust. We are standing right here in your purpose. Yes, you stand with us. You never cease to amaze us. All the praises, Lord, they belong to you. Jesus, we see all the glory. about to do every good thing every good thing comes from you every good thing every good thing comes from you continue our okay, so time of worship we're actually going to be introducing a new song today play for our foundation next. oh i'm early i'm so sorry <laughs> all right intro two one, thank you two, three. amen let's continue to praise the lord let's continue to worship For our redemption 
It's my turn. Good morning, church family. <laughs> now we're going to introduce a new song called Firm Foundation. And it comes from this verse that's going to come up on the screen. And you can read this with me. Or I'll grab it on my phone. Oh, there it is. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It says, everyone then, this is Jesus speaking. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and then the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell. And the great was the fall of it. So Jesus says, whoever hears my words and does them will be like a wise man who built 
his house on a firm foundation. So my question for you this morning is, do you hear the words of Jesus? And do you do them? When Jesus says, take heart, for in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the, wor the world. Do you hear the words of Jesus when he says, take heart in a difficult circumstance? Take heart, have faith in me and trust in me, or do you hear it and not have faith? When Jesus says, repent and believe, do you hear those words and do nothing about it? Do you not apply it to your life and to your heart? Or do you listen to his words, repent and believe and trust that he will satisfy your heart? Not the sin that he's asking you to turn away from, but Jesus himself will. Do you believe him? Do you hear and do what he says? Do you repent and believe? When Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with everything you are, do you hear those words and do that in your life? Do you apply those words? Do you trust that Jesus is true when he makes promises, when he says words? Or do you just listen to them and walk away every Sunday the same person that you were when you walked in? I want to encourage you to build your house on a firm foundation. And for some of us here today, you've been doing that. You've been walking steadfast in your faith. You've been firm in your faith with Jesus. I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Be an example to those of us who need an example in our lives of what it looks like to be firm in our foundation of Jesus. But for some of us here in this room, maybe you've been going astray. You've been losing faith. You've been like the, like the one who built their house on the sand. And you can feel the house moving. You can feel the house collapsing. I want to encourage you right now, today, before you leave this room, as we sing this new song, place your faith in Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus and trust that he will follow through with whatever he says, with his promises and his word. Trust, listen to his words and do them. That you will be like a wise man who built their house on a firm foundation. So before we get into this new song, I would like to pray together. So let's go ahead and close our eyes, bow our heads. such a glorious, sovereign, holy, all-powerful, all-knowing God that we could have faith in and not doubt. Lord, there is no circumstance of life. There is nothing in life that is too big for you to handle, for too big for you to take care of. There is no thing in life that we can go through, that we can experience, that we have to wonder if you will carry us through it, Father God. Lord, we thank you because you are such a good, good father that we can have faith in and never doubt. But Lord, for some of us in this room, our, doubt is uh, our faith is fading, our doubt is growing. And we, we, say, we say the words, I believe, but Jesus, help my unbelief. Lord, I pray for that person right now that you would give them a faith to trust in you to hear your words and to do what you have called us to do, to repent from our sins, that, that promise satisfaction, that promise to, to satisfy our hearts but don't, and to turn to the one who will. Lord, I pray that you would give us strength, Lord, for Jesus, you say do not be anxious. Lord, I pray for the anxious person in this room right now, that they would hear your words and trust in you. Lord, I pray for the non-believer in this room too. God, we can try to, to try, we can try to get through life. We can try to trust and hope that things will turn out okay. But Lord, there's nothing better than having a firm foundation on the Lord and the creator of this world who not only do we have to blindly hope, but know that you are taking care of us. Lord, I pray that we at Restoration Church, that we would be a church that has a firm foundation firm faith, a steadfast faith in you, God. And Lord, when we begin to go astray, I trust that you will convict our hearts and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will be, you'll bring us back to you. That you'll bring us back to you. For those who draw near to you, you will draw near to them. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that as we sing this song to you, that it would be an aroma of worship to you on your own. In the name of Jesus, God's people said,
We sing, I've still got joy. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I've built my life on Jesus. Cause he's there. Church, we sing it together. Thank you. 
church, you sing this. He won't sing, he won't fail. close to your heart and know that he won't fail, that he is faithful to you because he loves you, because you are his child and let that encourage you because the rain can come and the wind can blow but we stand on our firm foundation that is Jesus Christ. Let's continue to worship in prayer, church family. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you are our foundation, Heavenly Father. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, each and every one of us have experienced what it's like to have a foundation in something else. Father, and it may be good at times, but Lord, it crumbles at the end, knowing, knowing that the only firm foundation is you, Jesus. Father, help us to just dwell in that, in that truth today, Heavenly Father. Love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church family, go ahead and take a seat. Thank you so much. I want to start off by welcoming our first time guests. Can we give it up for them? Church family, our first time guests. Amen. We are excited that you decided to join us this morning. Thank you so much. It is an honor that you decided to be with us today. And I would like to get to meet you after this church service if, if it's at all possible, okay? We have a connection card that you can fill out and you just drop it off right there at the Next Step booth. It's right there on the back. Or you can go online, we have an app, and you can go on there and fill out the uh, first time guests. All the information's there as well. So if it is your first time, thank you so much for being here. Next, I want to thank you for your giving. Most of you know that over the last few weeks, we've been collecting for the uh, Homestead Soup Kitchen. So first, let's give it up for the Homestead Soup Kitchen. Thank you guys so much for your giving. Like you guys see it in the back as you come in, how much you've donated. Just thank you, seriously, without your giving, without your generous giving, we're not able to reach out to the community. We're not able to show the love of Christ, right? Because even Christ said it. And it, it. Christ came to serve and not be served. So thank you so much by serving through your giving. Uh, there are a couple of announcements that I want to share with everybody real quick. Next week is our membership commitment course. And if you're excited for those that are going to join the, uh, us as members, let's give it up for them, church family. Members, let's let them hear it. All right, that's next week. You still have time to sign up for that, okay? So if you're interested in becoming a member, if you've been coming to church for a while and you want to join the family, let me, let me just encourage you. And I promise you, you won't. You will not regret it. We have such, such a beautiful family here at the Restoration Church. So if you're interested in becoming a member, it's still, you still have time to sign up, okay? And also... We are starting to air our sermons on Mondays on Spotify, okay? So, that's right. We're starting to get with the times here at Restoration. So, if you miss a service on Sunday, right, for some of us that work or we go out of town, don't worry. Mondays, Spotify, the sermon will be there, okay? So, amen for that. Um, so, lastly, I want to I wanna go, I want to transition into a time of pastoral prayer, okay? So why do pastoral prayer? There's a couple of reasons, okay? 
Number one, because Jesus said, my, ho- my Father's house should be a house of prayer. Amen. So we're going to be a house of prayer, right? And this is an opportunity to pray for our brothers and sisters locally and globally, okay? So we're going to do that. So will you join me as we pray for them, please? Father, thank you so much for, for, for sending your son Jesus, Lord. Father, we would have no foundation if it wasn't for that. We would, we would be walking around just trying to find out what, 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 why we're here, Lord. And we know, we know why we're here, Lord. That is to glorify you. And that is through your son, Jesus, Father, who is our firm foundation. And we're grateful, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much. Lord, right now, I want to lift up our church families uh, locally. Fort Summit Church specifically. They are... Uh, they're moving locations, Lord, and uh, this is a good thing, right? But it's also a stressful time for them, Lord. Things can go, things can go wrong, you know, and, and we can get discouraged. So I just want to pray for for Summit Church, Lord, as they're transitioning to their new to their, to their new location. I want to pray for Pastor Alex, Lord. I pray that you give him peace during this time. I pray that the transition does go smooth, and that they have um, enough manpower to get it done smoothly, and that they have enough. Uh, and, and that the weather cooperates, Father. We pray for just, you know, we pray for, for, for it to go smoothly, Father, whatever that looks like. And, Lord, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters uh, globally as well. Lord, we have uh, a missionary couple in Italy, uh, Manu and Christina. Lord, um, they're doing such wonderful things over there in Italy, Father, for your kingdom. What a, what a blessing they have been to so many people over there. But, Lord, they're tired. Father, they're tired. They're weary, Heavenly Father. So right now, as a church family, we want to lift them up. We want to lift them up to you, Father. We pray for strength, Heavenly Father. We pray that you strengthen them, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that during this time that they're able to, to, to dive into your scriptures, Lord, and just remember your promises, Lord, like 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tells us, Father. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Father, (laughs) when we are weak, that is when you are strong. Heavenly Father, let, let our brothers and sisters be reminded of that, and give them strength through that. Lord, we love you so, so much, because you first loved us. And it's in your precious Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right, now if you're able to, please stand, and uh, we're going to take this time to greet one another. If you haven't, if, please greet somebody new today. There are a lot of new faces. Let's welcome one another in love. Church family, if we could find our way to our seats, that would be great. Hey, good morning, Christopher. How are you? I'm doing well. If we could find our way to our seats. Hey, Maggie. All right, we'll have some time after church. We got time. Some time. Don't be afraid to ask, hey, y'all want to go get some lunch after service? And y'all can have a great time. All right. Awesome. Church, thank you. Good morning. Oh, thank you. (laughs) My name is Sebastian, and I get to be the lead pastor here at Restoration Church, and I'm humbled to be able to bring the word this morning as we continue our worship in the scriptures. Now, this morning, once again, we will be continuing on in the gospel of Luke as we're going 
to look at a passage that, if I'm honest, it's, it's baffled me for, for probably a year now. This is one that I've wrestled with, I've been intrigued by, and it's one that I've circled on my calendar, on the preaching calendar, and I've been excited because I knew I wanted to have ample time to meditate on this passage here. And, and I'm going to share why this has baffled me for so long, but we'll get there, okay? So, but for now, I'll ask that if you brought your Bibles or you have the Bible app, I'll ask if you could please turn with me to the book of Luke, and we're going to be in chapter 7, and we're going to be in verses 18 through 23. If anyone needs a Bible or wants a Bible, a physical Bible, Angel has some back there to hand out, so you could just raise your hand, and he'll come and he'll, he'll run really fast and give it to you there. Now, if you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. We'll have all the verses come up on the screen so you can follow along that way as well. But once again, we're going to be in Luke 7, 18 through 23. So if you're there and you're ready to go, say hallelujah. hallelujah. I love it. We're ready. All right, Luke 7, 18 through 23. It says, The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, once again we come before your throne in humility come before your word, wanting to hear from you. Father, we're here with all our brothers and sisters in Christ, just ready to worship you, even through this moment. Father, I just pray that as we continue to walk through this passage, that you open our minds and hearts to your word, as the Holy Spirit illuminates our minds to hear what you have to say to us. And Father, we just pray, we pray for regenerated hearts this morning, Lord. We pray for life change this morning, not through anything I say, but through the power of your word. And Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for this moment. And Lord, we worship you with all that we have. And we pray for all these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, church, one thing that I wanted to let you know is that this upcoming week is actually a, a very, very big week for our church. And that's because this upcoming Friday, Charles Felton and Angel Paz, they will be ordained as our two newest pastors of Restoration Church. Yes, this is a, this is a big deal, and it's going to happen Friday at 7 p.m., uh, so you're invited to be right here in the sanctuary if you want to come and show your support for them. Uh, and I hope you do, because this is a beautiful thing for our church, and it's just another image of how God's hand has guided and protected and sustained our church, not just in the past, but also going forward into the future. Because now our elder table is going to grow to a table of five, and, and that's what we want for our church. We want a healthy plurality of elders so that we may be able to care for our members the way God has called us to care for them. Now, I will say, becoming a pastor is a big calling, and it's also one that contains many different responsibilities. And there's a lot of different aspects to that role. And there are many different things that we get to do. But you know, one of the things that we get to do is that we get the privilege to walk with people through many different areas of life, many different seasons of life. We get to walk with people in their high times and celebratory times where we get to celebrate with them through graduations and through weddings and when they have new babies and even if they get new job promotions. All these high times we get to rejoice with people. But not only do we get to rejoice with those who rejoice, but we also get to weep with those who weep. We get to be with people in their lowest points 
And we get to sit with them in the ashes as they mourn the loss of loved ones, the loss of jobs, the unknown uh, physical ailments and sicknesses as well. So we get to walk with people in the highs and in the lows. But then we also get to walk with people who are right there in the middle. Everything's kind of going good. And th these are great seasons of life for us. And we praise the Lord for that as well. But one, one area that I don't think we talk about enough that we walk through with people is actually what I call the wilderness period. And I call it the wilderness period because it's here that we don't really know what's going on in our life. We really don't know where God wants us to go, what he wants us to do, and we think we kind of know what he wants us to do and what we're going to go, but, but we don't really know, and it, things just don't make sense. And you see, it's in this wilderness period of our lives that these are times and seasons where we are waiting for the Lord to do something specific in our life. Waiting for the Lord to bring the right job that you can sustain your family with. Waiting for a relationship with someone where we've been single for a while and we're waiting for the Lord to bring the right person to us. Or we're waiting for the Lord to work in our spouse to bring them to salvation. Or waiting for the Lord to work in your child who's wandered off from the faith and is stuck in the vices of the world. Or maybe you're just waiting for direction. Waiting for answers, waiting to see where the Lord is going to take you because you kind of feel stuck. You don't know where, where you're going in your life. And there's so many things that it can be that we're waiting for. And th the truth is that when we're in this state, we're not really able to move forward with our life because it feels as if until these things get resolved, then you're just wandering Now, I myself, I went through my own wilderness period, and I've talked about that here before. But my wilderness period, I spent three years, three long years. In fact, actually, I look back and I say three years, that doesn't seem like a long time. But when you're going through it, three years feels like forever. But it was during a three-year period where I was waiting for the Lord to open up doors for me to go into full-time ministry. I was doing bivocational ministry, but I, I knew that I was called to do full-time ministry, and I waited. But it was here that I felt the most pain and suffering as I wrestled with the Lord during this time because it's through this wilderness and through this time of waiting that a bunch of questions start to arise. When we start to ask questions, it's like, why is this happening or why is this not happening? Why am I here? Like, when is this going to happen for me? And when it does happen, then what is that going to look like for myself and for my family? But then not only are there questions like that, but then also questions of doubt start to arise. Is this really what you want from me, Lord? Am I doing the right thing? Like, I thought this was from you, but now I'm starting to second guess. Is this from you or, or am I wrong? Is this a test? Are you testing me? I think we've all had one time or another where we've been in a situation like this, questioning in our hearts and minds, wondering what in the world is God doing with us? And what is the actual plan? Now, as we look at our passage this morning, we're going to see that this type of debacle is not anything new to mankind. But in fact, it's happening with one of the greatest prophets that has ever graced the earth. And that's John the Baptist. And now, we talked a lot about John the Baptist early on in this series through Luke because he's all over the first three chapters of Luke and it was then that we saw his infancy narrative accounts. But then we also see that when John gets older and he begins his ministry, he does so by literally coming out of the wilderness. Look at Luke 3, 2 through 3. It says, The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went out into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so John the Baptist, he literally had a wilderness period of his life where he wandered in the wilderness until God called him out of the wilderness and empowered him to begin his ministry. And even in the book of Matthew, it says that he came out. Look how he came out of his wilderness. It says he came out wearing a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. 
He has a, a coat of camels here, a leather belt. He's eating bugs and wild honey. It's disgusting, okay? But look, like, I, I don't know how we, come out, how we come out looking out of our wilderness stage, but John, like, he, he looked apart, okay? He looked apart. He came out like he just spent years in the wild, okay? But look, when John came out, he came out on fire for the Lord, and he came out ready to do what God had called him to do. That wilderness period was to prepare him for what he was about to do. Because John's role, even since before he was even conceived, was his role was that he was going to make the path straight for the Lord, where he would prepare the hearts and minds of the people of Israel for the coming Messiah. And how would he do that? Well, he did that by announcing that people were, that they were sinners and that they were in need to repent and that they needed to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And John made a huge impact in this way. And he caused a major stir in Israel. And everyone saw John the Baptist as a major prophet because they hadn't had a prophet for over 400 years. And they see him in this way. He even had his own disciples that would follow him and they would be students of his. And they would learn from him. And John, he did the groundwork and he prepped everyone for the long-awaited Messiah, and he did many, many great things for the Lord. But there is one thing that I don't even think John knew that he would have to do, and that is the fact that he would have to baptize the Messiah. And that's exactly what he does. John the Baptist, he baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. But listen, this wasn't any just normal baptism either, okay? Because listen, Listen to what it says in Matthew 3, what happens when Jesus is baptized. It says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And look at verse 17. It says, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, John the Baptist, he gets the privilege to baptize Jesus. He gets the privilege to baptize the Son of God. But not only does he get to baptize him, but then he also gets to witness the heavens literally open up. And he gets to see the Spirit of God descend from heaven and rest on the person of Jesus. But then not only just that, then he gets to hear a voice from heaven, the voice of God the Father, and his voice breaks through with bass and power as he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I mean, what a sight John the Baptist just saw. What words and what sound John the Baptist just heard. What an experience he had firsthand, and I can only imagine that as he was standing there looking at Jesus after he baptized him, he's in amazement of what's happening here. And this would be huge. And this is an extremely humbling experience for John and anyone else who would stand around. And it would be extremely humbling even for a man who was considered a mighty prophet. Even for a man who's so bold as John. Because we can't, we can't not realize that John was a very, very bold man. In fact, he was so bold that he even would go up and confront the sin of the most powerful man in the region at that time, which would be Herod. Now, Herod, he had taken a woman to be his wife, and her name was Herodias, which is a horrible name, by the way. <laughs> but he took this woman to be his wife named Herodias. And the problem was Herodias was actually his own brother's wife. So ill, right? That's not good. You don't do that. And John goes out and he says, hey, you can't do that. And he calls out his sin amongst other sins that Herod was doing as well. And this upsets Herod greatly because nobody likes to be confronted of their sin. So it upsets Herod greatly so much so that he throws John in prison. And that's actually where John is in our passage today. He's in a prison cell and it seems as if he's been there a while. In fact, it's believed that he was arrested shortly after he had baptized Jesus. So John, this whole time, he's missed out on seeing everything that Jesus has been doing. But listen, although he couldn't witness it, John is not missing out on hearing what Jesus is doing. Because his disciples, as John is in prison, his disciples, they're going and they're following Jesus around. 
And they're hearing his sermon on the plain. And they're witnessing all of his miracles. They see him heal the servant of the centurion. And they see him raise the widow's son from the dead. And they see all of these things. And they run back to report these things to John. And that's where our passage picks up today, starting in verse 18. Verse 18, it says, The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Okay, let's stop right there for a second. And we stop here because this is what I was talking about when I said this has baffled me for a long time. This, this doesn't make any sense. I don't understand what's going on here because why would John ask this? Why would he ask Jesus, hey, are you really the Messiah or should I look for someone else? Like how could John ask that question? I mean, literally John's whole life was dedicated to this ministry of preparing the way for the Messiah. And then when he sees Jesus by the Jordan River, he even proclaims that he's the Son of God. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sins of this world. He proclaims that, and then he baptizes Jesus, and he literally sees the heavens open up. Then he literally sees the Holy Spirit of God rest on Jesus, and then on top of that, he even hears the words of God the Father, thunderously resonate from his throne room in heaven saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. I mean, John experienced all of that. Yet he's here asking Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Or should we look for someone else? Why would John doubt like this? Why would questions like this arise after all he just saw and experienced? Isn't he supposed to be a major prophet? How could a man of God like this doubt? Well, I think it's important to point out that he wasn't the first prophet to doubt. Even Elijah in 1 Kings, he kind of gets into a battle with the prophets of Baal, who is a pagan god. And God demonstrates his power and proves that he is the only true God by sending fire from heaven. And he makes a huge display of his power. But it was right after that that Elijah, he gets fearful for his life because the queen wants to kill him. And he runs and he's scared. And he tells God, hey, you could just take me now. I don't want to live anymore. And Elijah doubts the power of God, even though he just saw him throw fire down from heaven. But it wasn't even just Elijah, even the prophet Jeremiah. After all that he went through, after all the despair that he endured due to persecution, rejection, and opposition from the people of Israel, he doubted that God would sustain him, and then he wished that he would die. He even said, man, I wish I was never born. And you see, it was after reading these things and after thinking about this, I began to realize why John would doubt. Because you know what brings up doubt in questions like this? Even in the most godly of people, like these prophets, what brings us to a place where we can question the Lord is when we are in a place of suffering. Because it's when we suffer that we tend to forget all that God has done for us in the past and we only concentrate on what is right in front of us. Because for many of us, I think we can all agree that we've seen God work in our lives in the past, where we can look back now and we can say, man, it's evident God's hand was with me in this situation, in this situation. There's no doubt about the fact that he is who he says he is. He's gotten me through so much. But then there are times when difficult circumstances and situations come up, and it's as if we're taking on those flaming arrows from the enemy right now. And we're in this waiting, wilderness period of our life, waiting for something, suffering for something. And it's in these moments that all we're focused on is what's coming at us. We're focused on this trial that we are enduring, and it hurts, and it's hard. And that causes us to forget the endless proofs of God's faithfulness in the past, and we get, begin to doubt His goodness in the present. 
And that's what's happening with John. John the Baptist, he doubted this way because he was suffering, because he was in prison. And it's here as he's in prison, as he looks down at his chains, that he realizes that while he may not be in the woods anymore, he for sure is in another wilderness season of life. Because now he's confused. And I mean, could you blame him? He's supposed to be the, Messiah, the forerunner for the Messiah. And now I'm sure he's thinking, you know, if, if I'm the forerunner for the Messiah and I did my job well, then why am I suffering now? I'm not being treated like the forerunner for the Messiah. This thing should be different for me right now. I should not be in prison. And then on top of that, his disciples keep coming to him, giving him reports of Jesus. And they're telling him what he's doing. And they're saying that he's preaching grace. And that he's healing people. He's showing compassion. And he's showing mercy to people. Well, for us, this sounds great. For John, this would have been confusing as well. Because John's whole message, when he was baptizing people, it was, he was saying, you need to repent of your sin. Because when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring immediate judgment right now. So you better repent right now. But here's the thing. Jesus, when he came, he didn't bring immediate judgment. In fact, the world was still upside down. Where the righteous people and the godly people and those who were trying to do right, they were still suffering, like John. And the wicked and those who were doing evil, like Herod, were still prospering. Things hadn't changed. And I believe this is, this is why John is suffering so much. This is the biggest aspect of his suffering. Because yes, being in prison, yeah, that's hard. But his suffering is not necessarily in the physical aspect but his suffering is in the waiting. He wanted the Messiah to come and restore things right now. That's what he was expecting. He expected Jesus to come, restore things right now. There would be judgment, and then he would usher in the new kingdom, where he would be the king of Israel, Roman rule would be taken away, and then the new kingdom would be there, and everything would go how it was supposed to be. But that's not happening. What John expected is not happening at all. And because of this, he started to wonder whether he had been mistaken. Now he starts to have doubts in his mind as to whether, am I really the forerunner for the Messiah? Did I get this wrong? And is Jesus really the Messiah? And it's in this suffering of waiting that all these questions come up. And he just had to ask. He says, are you him or should we look for someone else? When is this going to happen? I'm tired of waiting. And you see, John's suffering in the waiting, it caused him to question everything. But now what's beautiful about this passage is that although John, although he's questioning all these things in his cell, Jesus doesn't actually rebuke John. But in fact, he answers him in a way that only Jesus could answer him. Let's continue reading. Because they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Verse 21. It says, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And in verse 22 he says, And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. You see, John, he, he asks these questions of Jesus. He says, are you the one, or should we look for another? And Jesus hears this question from John's disciples, and it's almost as if he looks at them and he says, watch this. And he turns, he starts healing people. He starts healing people of their diseases, of all of their plagues. He removes evil spirits from people. He gives people their sight. He gives the deaf hearing. He helps the lame to walk. And he even preaches the good news of salvation to the poor. And when he's done, he turns back to the disciples and he says, Hey, go and tell John what you just seen and heard. Tell him of these works. And those disciples, they must have been awestruck as well. But listen, with this response of Jesus, I don't want us to miss what he's actually saying to John here. Because there is an underlying message in what Jesus says. 
Because you see, what's amazing, that under all of that, under all that Jesus just did, what Jesus is really telling John's disciples, he says, hey, you need to go back and deliver this message to John. And this is the message I want you to tell him. John, go and read your Bible. You need to go back and read your Bible, John, because if you would just read your Bible, your question will be answered. Because if you were to read, John, in Isaiah 35, verses 5 through 6, when the prophet Isaiah talks about the coming Messiah, the prophet, he said that when the Messiah comes, that it will be then that the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And then if that's not enough, John, read Isaiah 61, verse 1, where it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. You see, John's expectations of what the Messiah should be was not in line with what the Bible said that he would actually do when he came. So Jesus, by his actions... And by his instructions to his disciples, he tells John to once again look at the scriptures. He says, John, because if you look at the scriptures, John, you will see that I am the Messiah. My actions prove who I am. My actions prove that I am. I am the great I am. I am the one who is the author of life. I am the one who walked in the cool of the garden with Adam, who talked with Abraham, who wrestled with Jacob, who conversed with Moses and in a burning bush. And I told him to take off his sandals because where he's standing is holy ground. I am the one who went before my people of Israel. I am God the Son, and I am the one who has come to free my children from their bondage of sin. I am the one who came to die for the sins of my people, for all of those who would put their faith in me. And those who put their faith in me, I would take on their iniquities, and I would wash them white as snow. I am the one who came to proclaim liberty to the captives. He says, look what I'm doing, John. And then look at the scriptures. Because if you were just to look and see and hear, you would know that I am the Savior of the world. There is no need to look for another. I am here now. You see, John, he had doubt in his times of suffering. He had doubt in his times of waiting. But Jesus has more than proved who he is. And he left no reason for doubt by pointing to the scriptures. And I will say that it's the same for us, even over 2,000 years later. Because in our suffering, in our wilderness periods of life, and even in our good and high seasons of life, it's here that our doubt should be dissolved by looking to the pages of Scripture. Because it's through the words of Scripture, through every jot and tittle, every little mark of Scripture, everything points us to Christ. Christ is written all over Scripture. And this is huge, because even though our circumstances may change in our life, Christ never changes. He is always who he has proved himself to be, the son of the most high God, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And he is all these things and more in our times of highs and in our times of lows, and even in our times where we feel like we're just wandering around in the wilderness. Christ remains the same. He does not change. His promises don't change. And his word remains forever as he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And as we trust in that truth, we also must understand that our faith and trust in Christ requires patience. Our faith and trust in Christ requires patience. You see, John, here, he, he gets his answer from Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, I'm the Christ. Look at the scriptures. But what this also means for John now is that he's going to continue to have to be patient. He must wait in patient faith for Christ to complete his work. And he's going to have to be okay with the fact that the outcome is, may not look like what he expected it to look like. But you see, the call to wait in patient faith for John is also the same call for us today as well. 
Because as we wait for the Lord to move in our lives, in whatever area it is that we've been waiting for him to move, as we wait, I implore you that we must be patient. Listen, the, the biggest thing that I learned from my long three years in my wilderness period, the biggest thing that I learned is patience. That I really had to wait for God's hand to move in my life and to fight that battle of trying to just control everything on my own and make my own decisions and do my own thing. I had to wait and be patient. But listen, it was also during that time that I had, I had expectations for the Lord. I had a, an expectation that he would put me in full-time ministry. I didn't know what that would look like, though. I, I created things up in my mind, what that may look like. But let me tell you, after all of that waiting for the Lord, I'm here to tell you today that the Lord exceeded these expectations in a grandeur way and placed my family and I in the perfect place at the perfect time for us to do ministry. And listen, I tell you that not to look at me at all, but I tell you this because the fact remains that it's when we patiently wait for the Lord and that we trust in his plan over our own plan. It's then that we will get to see how he blows our expectations of what we think to be good. He blows those expectations out of the water. Because his plans and his timing is perfect for us. But we must wait in faith and we must be still and know that he is God. We must believe that his plan is greater than our own. Now with that said, I also know like, there's no doubt about the fact that waiting is hard. Seasons of waiting are hard. We see that with John the Baptist. We've experienced that for ourselves. In waiting, we see all these sorts of questions and doubt that come up. But listen, the only way to combat these doubts and these questions, the only way that we can get through sitting in the waiting room for so long, the only way is by drawing near to Christ in his word and through prayer and through fellowship with other believers. So many times when people are suffering in these seasons of waiting, what people do is they isolate themselves. They isolate themselves from God. They isolate themselves from God's church. They isolate from, from his people. But listen, that's exactly what the enemy would want you to do. And it's the absolute worst thing that you can do because it's only through a near touch with Christ that you can see and hear and experience what Christ has to offer you. In the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, he, he makes this statement. He says, good things as well as bad, you know, are caught by kind of an infection. A good thing or a bad thing can be caught by an infection. Listen to what he says. He says, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. And then even later on, he says, if you're close to it, the spray will wet you. If you're not, you will remain dry. Church, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. And I have to ask this morning, who here is cold? Church, if you want to be wet, then you must get into the water. And I have to ask this morning, who here is dry? Are you close enough to Christ to experience what he has to offer you, which is joy, power, peace, and eternal life? Listen, the best way to patiently wait is to wait under the arm of Christ. Not to isolate ourselves from him and his people, but we are to dive into his word and into his promises and draw near to him in prayer and have a communion with God that resembles that of the Trinity, of a, of a continual and everlasting love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are brought into that by our faith in Christ, where we are as adopted as sons in Christ, where God the Father sees us as he sees his Son. Because when we draw near to him, not only do we get to see him work in our life, 
but then we also get to go and tell others about what he's doing in our life and in the lives of others. Just like John's disciples, they had the privilege to go and tell other people, look what Jesus is doing. Look at what he has done. And that's why Jesus, he even ends in verse 23. He says, and blessed is the one who's not offended by me. If we are proclaiming his name, that shows that we are not offended by him. Let us preach this good news. Because you see, it is from this grace of God, this undeserved favor from God. It's from this grace that we have a fellowship with Jesus. And this is one that we must proclaim. So let us immerse ourselves in our relationship with him. And let us trust and wait in patient faith. Because here's the thing, to close this up. We have to see today that we now, we join in with John the Baptist in his season of waiting. John was waiting for the upcoming judgment and for the consummation of the new kingdom. And let me tell you, there is an upcoming judgment, but there also is an upcoming time where all things will be restored. And in Matthew 24, verse 30, Jesus says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. Church, we get to patiently wait for our good Father in heaven. We get to wait for Christ who has saved us from our sins. We get to patiently wait for his coming back. But let me tell you this, there is no doubt about the fact about who he is in scripture and there's no doubt about the fact that he is coming for his church and he is coming for his bride and there will be a day where there will be no more tears and there will be no more pain and there will be no more waiting and we will sit in perfect harmony as we witness and we worship the glory of our father in heaven. So let us endure with a faith and a patience that is one to be admired by those who don't know Christ. And to those who don't know Christ, I pray that you come to him. Because there is a judgment, but there is eternal life. There is a peace that you can endure right now. And in these hard seasons of life, he can bring you through those. And you can endure all those things under his arm, under his grace, and under his peace. Amen. Amen. Church, let us pray. Father, once again, Lord, what a glorious hope that we have, <laughs> that we don't wait with no hope. But Father, we're able to wait in a confidence and an assurance that you hear us and that you see us and that you will do what you have said that you will do. And Lord, we patiently wait along with John the Baptist for your coming. And we patiently wait with all the other brothers and sisters in Christ here on earth. And we patiently wait with, with even the earth that longs for your glory and that longs for the new creation of all things to be made perfect and to be made back into the way that you intended it to be. Father, help us in our waiting. Touch our hearts and give us endurance and give us your strength to endure. Because, Father, we can't do this on our own. But, Father, help us not to forget all the good that you've done in our past, all the times that you have been faithful to us. Help us not to forget that in the middle of our trials. But Father, help us to look back on that and help us to hold on to that knowing that you will do that once again. Because Lord, you are faithful. You will remain faithful. It is who you are. Father, help us to trust in that and to trust in you. Father, we love you and we thank you and we pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, church, as we continue our worship through the word in a moment, if you're able, you will be able to stand and we'll sing one more song. But as we do so, I also do want to invite you for prayer. We have our prayer team up in the front. We also have our pastors and directors in the back that would love to pray with you 
and take this time to do so. And we would love to just spend that time in prayer with you. So church, if you're able, please stand and as we continue our worship.
lift them up, church family. Yes, yes. Amen, church family. What a great, encouraging message today. Amen. Church family, if you are going through the wilderness today, let me remind you, you are not alone. Right? Psalm 23, 4 reminds us, even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You guys know it. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For you are with me. And what a, what a reminder that verse 6, it doesn't end there, right? It doesn't end in the wilderness. Amen, church family? Right? How does it end? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is what we have to look forward to. Amen, church family? That is what we have. That is the joy and peace that we rest in. It's in the, it's in the truth that we will be with him forever one day, church family. Amen, amen. What an encouragement. And just as a reminder, as you leave, I will be in the back. If it's your first time, please come shake my hand. I want to say hi to you. Thank you so much for being here. And again, it's our last week for the Homestead Soup Kitchen. If you want to donate, you still have time. And you have time to sign up for our membership course that's starting next week. Okay? Church family, I love you so much. Be encouraged. Go in peace.